Uh, hi everyone, I haven't actually got um, a PowerPoint presentation, I'll just be speaking, um, hopefully you don't mind. Um, I'm going to start off by talking about the kind of journey that I've got on to like how I got diagnosed and that sort of thing. And then I'm going to move on to talk about how I sort of manage my keratotonus in my day-to-day -day life. So I'm just going to be speaking to you and I've got some notes in front of me just to help me out. Um, so I guess for me it kind of started in 2007 when I was like 13, 14 years old. I was in my living room and I was just sitting on my couch and you know just trying to look at the TV listings you know because I always watch TV and um, I just couldn't see it properly. It was actually very blurry um, and I don't remember why but for some reason I started playing around and covering one eye and then covering the other and I realised that actually when I covered my left eye the right eye was like very very blurry like I couldn't make out much of the text at all the other eye was fine so if I like, covered my right eye my left eye was pretty functional um I didn't really do much about it at the time because you know sometimes when you sit in front of the tv too long which is what I did a lot of when I was in my teens you just your vision gets blurry so I kind of ignored it for a while um later on I remember watching tv again actually with my mum and I think we were watching Oprah or something like that and they were talking about being left eye or right eye dominant so we were trying to figure that out and then I remember mentioning to her then that actually I really can't see much out of my right eye at all and I think she thought I was exaggerating but I was like no no seriously I really can't um, and at that point I think a few weeks later she decided to like book me and see our normal opticians um, I had worn glasses previously but I just kind of stopped wearing them um, and honestly, when I went back to the opticians, I was just kind of expecting them to prescribe me or, you know, give me some more glasses. I didn't really think that it would be anything serious. Um, so I went to, I remember going to the opticians, um, telling them about the sight problems that I was having, telling them that it was worse in one eye than it was in the other, and doing like, you know, where they get you to read the letters. Um, and yeah, with the left eye, it was reasonable. You know, I couldn't see much of the fine stuff, but with the right eye, because they got me to cover one, like even the largest like letter, I just couldn't see properly. And then the optician looked kind of shocked, and then he got some type of tool out in front of my eye and then started doing all these checks. I was like, well, what's going on? Um, and then he said, oh, you have something beginning with K. Honestly, at the time, I didn't really hear what he said, and I didn't note it down. And... Um, yeah, I went, I think I went by myself, I went with my dad, and I don't think either of us got the name written down at the time. So then when I went home, my mum was like, okay, what happened? I was like, oh, he said I have some condition, I don't know what it is. Um, <laughs> eventually, like, we did get, like, a, like a written letter with the condition written down, keratotonus. Um, my mum was kind of distraught, she sat at the back, actually. She was, like, really upset about it, and I was just like, okay. And, um, <laughs> I don't know, maybe it was just because of my age. At the time, I think I was, like, 14, but... Um, I, didn't, I don't think I actually realised just how like, serious it was at the time and actually how lucky I've been since because you know, it's not a good condition to have but I think I've been very fortunate with the amount of support and help that I've got both medically and both in terms of care, you know, just like in my day-to-day -day life because um, I remember not too long after going to this like, initial local optician appointment you know, my mum kind of immediately got on the case I think through her work she had some like private health insurance so we went to see a doctor like a, like a specialist straight away to give us some more advice um i live in south london i live not too far away from the saint george's hospital and they have a, a moorfields division there so for the entirety of my care i've kind of just been going there and i've been seen primarily by uh, dr rostron who's been absolutely excellent because um i mean i got diagnosed i think somewhere in the beginning of 2008 when I was 14. By the end of 2008 I had collagen cross-linking and at that time I was I was still I think I was I just turned 15 and I don't at the time I didn't know this but apparently there was you know collagen cross-linking was still relatively new um, there was still I don't know if people were sure if it was going to work or something like that and I was very young I don't know if, I think you had to be 16 or something. I don't know what kind of strings my mum pulled or what the hospital pulled, but they, I'm, I was able to get the procedure done at the age of 15. That was at the end of 2008. Um, it was a really weird procedure, actually, because you're actually awake for the procedure. So they give you, like, local anaesthetic in your eye, and then they clamp it open. And then I just remember them, like, kind of scraping on it. <laughs> um, 
it was it was really weird sensation. Initially, I was kind of like, agitated, but I think I calmed down eventually. And then they put you under like this UV light. Um, so I had that, and then the next summer, so I think summer 2009, in my right eye, because obviously that's the one that's worse, I had, um, I think it's DALC or I don't know, like it was some sort of graph. Um, and those are like the two procedures that I've had. So one was to kind of stop the progression, because they said I did have it in my left eye, it just hadn't progressed, thankfully. Um, and so far, fingers crossed, it's fine, and fingers crossed it will stay that way. Um, yeah, and I had the transplant in the right eye. Unfortunately, like, it's not that much better. So, you know, I'm still, like, mainly, my left eye is the one that I see out of most of, because the right eye, it's not really, you know, not much use. So that's kind of um, how I found out about it, the procedures that I've had. So I thought I'd talk a bit now about how I manage and cope with it in my day-to-day -day life. So um, when I found out about it, because I knew that I was going to need to go to hospital a few times to get seen by doctors because I knew that um, I was going to be having surgery. Of course, I told my school, or at least my mum told the school, and they immediately like offered support, like without us even having to, you know, go to them and say, you know, is there anything else that Ashley can have? They were just like, um, the head of the learning support department at my school came to us, they had a meeting with us, they talked to me and said, okay, you know, what kind of things do you need? What can we do for you? So it was very much them coming to me. I didn't even realise that I would be able to get help something like that and I think that was like right when I was at the end of year nine so going into year 10 I had a lot of support actually um the school gave me like my own laptop so I could write notes so for instance um instead of like writing it on a piece of paper I could just uh, write notes obviously enlarge it to whatever sort of font I wanted um initially what would happen was the textbook I mean the print was quite small so they would photocopy it onto A3 and um, initially that wasn't very convenient because, you know, if you think of it like a, a, a science textbook, for instance, and they're photocopying an entire chapter on A3, it's like a massive wad of paper. So I remember like when I was doing my GCSEs, I would just have like, packs of, like piles of paper in my room um, because it was just like they were photocopying like the entire textbook into like A3 sheets just so I could see it and so it was more accessible. And, you know, they did the thing with the colour, so they printed it on, I think, uh, sort of a cream background because that was slightly better for me um, and so that's kind of some of the support I got at school I always had a seat um, I mean my classes were quite small anyway so I always had a seat at the front you know if I requested to a teacher could you write in black against like the white board because you know when they use like the faint green pen or blue pen or something like that I couldn't really see so um, that's another thing um, and then also when it came to examinations I was able to get extra time so even now that I'm at university I have 25% extra time so 25% of whatever the time is so um, I think two hours I think I get an extra like 15 minutes or something like that so they give just an extra 25% I also had the ability in my exams to get rest breaks so if my eyes were tired that means like I could just tell the examiner and they'd pause the clock for me and then um, you know they would I like, I'd, I'd be able to pause my eyes and then go back and they'd restart the clock again. I mean, obviously this sort of thing can be quite disruptive sometimes to the other students that are doing their exams. So another thing that I did also get was a separate exam room. Um, and yeah, all of these things have really, really helped me. And these are things that like my school proactively suggested to me. And so yeah, I've been very, thank I'm very grateful for that support that I have. And then things got a lot better when I got to A-levels because I think at this point I started to get a bit more familiar with the kind of equipment that there was out there and how I could just make things easier for myself. I think one of the things I didn't like about um, the GCSE phase, not only was like, having masses, masses of paper in like, my room, but also just like the embarrassment, because like, not everybody knew that I had a sight condition, but then they would all just get given regular pieces of paper, like notes, and then I'd get these like, massive A3 things, and then everyone was kind of looking like, what's going on over there? And, um, yeah, so one thing that I wanted as I kind of got on was for things to be a bit more discreet and going into A-levels, you know, actually um, a lot of people would bring laptops in and I had a laptop that the school assigned me and I made sure to try and get my textbooks that I needed digitised. So, um, you know, a lot of the modern textbooks nowadays that you have for A-levels, GCSEs, they usually have a PDF copy. So if you can, you know, prove to the publishers, you know, I'd read right to them. And if you can prove to them that you know you're a student, you can prove that you know they have these textbooks at school. They will just give you a digitised copy. So, one thing that made my life so much easier when I was at school was having my laptop 
and having the books that I, my textbooks, digitised so that I could just zoom in as much as I wanted on the computer. It was a bit more discreet. It wasn't as cumbersome as having lots of paper um, lying around. Um, and from that point on, I've kind of just tried to go electronic with most things, as you can probably see now. Um, so that was sort of the A-level phase. And that was very, very useful because that was like quite a stressful time for me. And especially in my final year, as I was doing my um, last couple of exams, because I did, I did a lot of science subjects. I did physics, maths, further maths, and I think chemistry. And it's quite modular, or at least it was when I did it. So whereas other people that were doing humanities maybe had like one or two really long exams, like three hours, I would have like six or seven, you know, maybe like one, two hour exams or something like that. So there was like a lot of exams back to back. And having all these concessions, having this support um, was really good for me. Um, fortunately, I did get into my UT of choice. I went to, um, I, oh, I'm currently a student at Imperial College, um, London. And um, during the application process, actually, um, I, when I actually got my offer, we went to the, um, like, I think it was the, like, learning support group at the university to try and get some advice from them about if I'd be able to have similar concessions once I got to university. And they were so supportive of me, even though I wasn't yet a student, like I was just a prospective student or somebody that had gotten an offer. And once I, you know, they told me as well about DSA, and if you go through them, you can tell them about your condition and then they can suggest um, equipment to you, which you can have um, ready for university and obviously it's paid for. So um, I remember going to the RNIB and having an assessment and they suggested a lot of equipment to me. And again, like with each step, so from GCSE to A-level and then from A-level to university, things have just become a lot smoother for me and a lot easier to manage. Um, when it comes to the kind of equipment that I use now that I'm at university, at home, I have two monitors which are, I think, 27 inches. So then they're, they're next to each other. And I have a laptop. And usually what I do, the laptop itself, the screen is 17 inches. So if I need to use the laptop by itself, the screen is big enough so that if I zoom in, um, hopefully the text doesn't run off to the side too much because that's quite annoying when you have to scroll to the side as well as down. Um, so I have two monitors. I have a laptop, which then I can hook up using one of those cables to the monitors. And then the great thing about that is, for instance, I could have one of my PDF textbooks or a web page on one, one screen as large as I need. And then on the other screen, I can have like a Word document where I'm writing an essay, and I can have that as large as possible. When it actually comes to lectures, a lot of my lecturers don't use the textbook. They'll use their own lecture notes. And so what used to happen in first year initially is that they would give me, again, a large print copy. But I decided that I wanted to kind of go paperless just because it is quite cumbersome. So um, there's Blackboard, which is where they store all the lecture notes. and that is how I access um, the notes now when I go to uni. So I have an app on my tablet. I can just go on that app, um, download the lecture notes so I can see what the lecturer is showing to the class and what he's referring to. And I can, I have like an application as well where it allows me to write on the PDF because a lot of the time PDFs are kind of stubborn and they don't want you to like edit it, but I can write on it, I can make notes, I can upload it. Um, for instance, I'm using a software now where I can just like do handwritten stuff and then enlarge it and then I can upload it as a PDF later. So I think electronics, I guess it's just like the era I've, I was lucky, you know, I guess to have it at this time where there's just so much um, equipment now to support me. So I feel like I'm quite independent. Things are a lot more discreet for me. So nobody that I would feel uncomfortable knowing necessarily needs to know about my condition. Of, of course, my lecturers know. Um, and staff at my uni, maybe some close friends, but, you know, there's not the situation anymore, which I used to have when I was at school, where, you know, they would go around and have to give me, like, a massive, like, large print piece of paper, and I'd stand out, because I just have this, and lots of people have, like, electronic devices now at university, so I can have things, I can have them in the way that's accessible to me, um, and, yeah, it's just a bit less embarrassing. So that's kind of... Um, how I've been coping with it, and that's kind of my journey so far. I'm going into my final year, and I just kind of will probably just be doing more of the same, really, um, in terms of using the equipment, maybe trying to find some more apps or whatever that help me a bit more. So for me, it's really just figuring things out as I go along, trying to find things. But that's kind of all I have for you. I don't know if that's too short. Yeah, that's basically.